undergraduate faculty advisor in physics. And this is the career panel for the undergraduate students. Um, so I'll just get started with a very short presentation. Then we'll have uh, Megan from the Career Center um, say a few words. And then our panelists will um, introduce themselves and say uh, things that they want to say. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll kick off the panel with uh, questions from the, the students. All right, so I can, looks like I can, I can share the screen. Can I um, be allowed to share my slides? Yeah, I'm looking at the settings now, just double tracking. Is it not letting you share your slides? Yeah, I'm technically a co-host, but it's not. Uh... All right, can you try again go. now? Yep, I can share now. Thank Perfect. You. Okay, so. Um, um, all right, so. Um, undergraduate degree in physics. So you're getting your degree and what can you do with that? And that's where we'll be, what we'll be talking about today. Uh, I have some uh, statistics and some graphs, some of which are uh, more up-to-date and some are not, not may seem not so up-to-date. I'll explain to you why uh, momentarily, but this is uh, statistics from our uh, own uh, physics seniors. Uh, from uh, years 21 and 22. And it basically shows you what um, they were thinking, uh, planning on doing after graduation. And on the top of this slide is work full time. And that is the by far the most common of the individual answers here. Although the answers in the second box have to do with you know going to grad school and in various fields and you know they're sort of on par with uh, the first one but still I would say the um, working full time is the most common activity um, after graduation so how do you get that full time job with uh, a bachelor's degree in physics what kind of jobs. Uh, uh, these may be, and so on and so forth, and this is what we'll be talking about today. Um, so, I mean, before you move on to that next stage in your life, um, you might want to ask you some questions um, about where you see your future, how you see yourself in the future, and of course these things will change. Uh, with time, you may find uh, yourself adjusting your plans accordingly, but now is a time at least to plan for the next few years and maybe uh, beyond that. So you might think uh, about what kinds of skills do you enjoy using? Do you enjoy using your, uh, um, I don't know, experimental work skills or do you like thinking and solving problems and creating theories? Um, and then maybe what drives you up the wall, what, uh, you know, things that you maybe not, don't like <laughs> to do so. Think about your strengths and your weaknesses. Um, and then now that you sort of have an idea of what these things may be that you may enjoy and not enjoy doing, then you can figure, try to start to figure out where you can do that and get paid uh, for doing what you like, which is, is a pretty ideal uh, situation. Really. So, you know, there are many places that have um, open uh, openings uh, for doing research, but even if they don't have current openings, you can still research and ask and reach out and see what's available there. Uh, also thinking more long-term, think about things that you may learn uh, in the near term while working. Um, so that you acquire these qualifications and get your long-term dream job. And sort of more immediate things that you can do is to create uh, resumes or CVs or cover letters and think about how they can be tailored to the particular job that you might be applying to. Uh, work on your online presence, LinkedIn. Um, and uh, also like just 
just spend time thinking about it. Prepare short description of what you are and you know, so-called elevator pitch. And network. Network is networking is how you find your next job very often. So uh, more graphs, this is even more ancient and this is from uh, combined 19 and 20 uh, uh, graduating classes of physics bachelors. So uh, American Institute of Physics uh, maintains, technically maintains this database, but they have not updated it since 2021. So this is the most recent um, statistics. And I would say it's probably still valid. So uh, roughly half, slightly under a half of um, physics bachelors find a job after graduation. About a third go to uh, grad schools. Actually, no, it's more like, sorry, 40% roughly go to grad schools of various um, levels. Uh, but of those who find employment, this is the distribution. Largely it's private sector, almost two thirds um, college university jobs and high school. So academic employment is probably about a third overall. No, it's more like, a, sorry, about a quarter. I should adjust my viewing angle here. Military and government jobs uh, account for about 10% and other, whatever that may be. So the employment, as you can see, is largely the private sector. And that, um, you know, there's a reason for that. That's where the jobs are for uh, physics bachelors. And these are some of the titles. I won't go through all of them, but you'll find uh, the job titles of the newly, um, freshly uh, graduated uh, physics bachelors in, in these various companies or in education, high school teacher in education or uh, process engineering or laser engineer uh, in uh, some engineering company, uh, research associate or accelerator operator uh, somewhere in the research and development uh, employment and um, software engineer, engineer and uh, web developer in uh, various computing um, and software companies. Just to give you a flavor of what oh, jobs may be, why is it? It's not clicking through the slides. Um, and I'm almost done with, uh, with the graphs. This is just one more. Uh, this is just the skills that uh, people end up really using in their daily or weekly uh, employment tasks. And they're kind of uh, separated for engineering and computer science here, but working as a team seems to be one of the um, most important one in solving technical problems in both applications. And then obviously, in software, in computer science, uh, programming is one of the top tasks, but pro project, project management um, is something that people do a lot. Um, so the ones that are kind of highlighted here are the skills that we hope that we teach you uh, in our physics undergraduate education, technical writing through either doing reports in labs or maybe uh, writing papers for some of your um, classes as final exams. Uh, definitely knowledge of physics and astronomy. We hope that we teach you that uh, and also advanced math. Some of the programming, we don't really teach programming, but we have classes that heavily utilize it and you can teach, you are supposed to learn programming in order to participate in those classes. Um, but doing research as an undergraduate gets you a lot of these skills. Maybe not all of them. You don't usually do quality control, maybe as a research assistant uh, in a lab. But many of these uh, you do gain. Uh, a little bit on the salaries. Again, the information, unfortunately, has not been updated by the American Institute of Physics, so I don't have an update on salaries. So I don't know, multiplied by 1.2 maybe. Should we get if 20% <laughs> raise from um, like four years ago? Um, obviously private sector uh, STEM disciplines are the highest 
paid on average. This bar in the middle is the median salary and this is the standard deviation. Well, it's not standard deviation. The standard deviation is the blue uh, and this is the kind of the, I don't know actually how many standard deviations is the error bar, but probably a few. And there's some outliers up, up here. Um, but, you know, uh, the salaries, of course, vary depending on where you end up uh, in high school or in a government lab um, or in military. Um, but this uh, can give you some idea of the salaries that you can um, get with a physics bachelor's. And uh, these are, this is a list that is definitely incomplete only partial of various companies that are firing or have fired hired in the past, at least the recent past, uh, were physics um, bachelors. And they range from big ones like Amazon, Amazon Web Services to smaller ones, um, many of which I just don't even know. <laughs> but Fred Hutchinson uh, Research Center, University of Washington, oh, it's here, US Navy and Microsoft, but then um, there are many more uh, local companies that hire physics bachelors. And um, there's some resources uh, that you can use to find those, um, either find jobs and fi fi find information about getting a job, including uh, other faculty, other alumni, uh, faculty in the university and alumni neighbors, people on the bus, maybe somebody sitting next to you on the bus is your next uh, boss. <laughs> and that's my, uh, my presentation. Um, I didn't want to take more time than necessary. So um, if there are any questions right now, I would be happy to answer. And if not, we can uh, turn it over to uh, Megan. All right. If there are any questions, feel free to you know keep bringing them up. Uh, but thanks, Boris. Uh, it's uh, really exciting to be here uh, to talk a bit about what we offer from the Career and Internship Center. Uh, similarly, if there's any questions throughout my time kind of talking, feel free to put those into the chat and we'll take pauses. We can go through. I know that there will be plenty of time at the end. Uh, for questions, both you know, for myself, and then we can get into a really exciting panel. Uh, so um, I am similarly going to uh, just share some of my screen as well. So from here, uh, just a brief introduction of who I am, and then we're going to just talk a little bit about what we offer at the center, uh, digging a little bit into some of the topics that Boris here brought up, like being able to network with others and uh, you know, take that extra step to, uh, you know, meet the people on the bus and uh, anyone else who might be of interest. So uh, my name is Megan Wood. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. I'm one of the career coaches on our team. Uh, we can see here we're a pretty good sized team. Uh, these four folks here, myself included, are the career coaches. And while none of us necessarily have a background in STEM, we all really enjoy getting to have interesting conversations with interesting people. We get to live vicariously through you all and uh, you know, help you figure out what your job search is going to look like, what interests you. Uh, so feel free to uh, take advantage of you know this resource. Uh, you don't just have now to use it as well. I'll use this as a chance to plant the seed that we're here uh, for you throughout your you know academic or sorry your career journey. You know even up to three years after you graduate. Uh, because there's a lot of things that we offer. So through our website, we do have a couple of things and I'm not going to walk us through the whole thing, but I am going to highlight um, you know, a couple of really important pieces. So the things that I would really recommend uh, kind of paying attention to firstly are the services that we offer. Uh, so I'm gonna highlight firstly, the fact that we do offer career coaching appointments. Uh, and like I said, it's both for current students at the undergrad and the graduate level. Uh, plus anyone who has earned a degree in the last three years. So you have 36 months and we can talk about anything from helping you explore different career paths. You know, resume reviews are pretty much the bread and butter of what we do. Uh, we go through a lot of resumes, which is always really, uh, you know, nice. Just get to help you better understand how to kind of portray yourself to employers. Uh, I know that job and internship searching is really big right now. And then 
now moving into things that are all about networking and interviewing uh, is really big as well. Um, with the addition of if anyone is interested in applying to graduate school, uh, whether that be a master's program or a PhD level, like those are all things that uh, we're all equipped to kind of help you kind of work through and, you know, better you know, portray yourself because that's a hard part of uh, kind of translating your experiences to a work for a different audience sometimes. Uh, so you can always uh, schedule an appointment in Handshake. Uh, and I will share this link. I'm going to share a couple throughout our time together. So you can all, uh, you know, jot these down or you know, pull them up and see, you know, what works best for you. But scheduling an appointment is the best way to have a uh, usually a quick 30 minute conversation with, you know, a coach uh, to go through, you know, whatever you have questions about. Um, I'm also going to point out that we have these different workshops and events, but uh, part of that is our career fairs. So I'm going to kind of plug that we actually have a career fair. Uh, these are from Autumn, uh, but we actually have a career fair tomorrow. Uh, so if anyone hasn't already, you know, gone online uh, onto Handshake uh, and seen who's going to be there or registered, I highly recommend it. We have 101 employers who are going to be there. Uh, so you can check out all the employers. Uh, I'll also uh, point out you can use different filters, like if you're looking for an internship versus a job. Um, I know that there's at least one really valuable national laboratory that's going to be there that I wanted to you know point out, uh, the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. There's a lot of other tech companies that are going to be there, uh, plenty of other energy and uh, government, uh, you know, companies that are going to be there. You know, Pokemon is going to be there. There's a lot of really cool places uh, that you can come and interact with. So highly recommend, uh, you know, even if you just show up for like a half an hour, 20 minutes, uh, it's from 11 until 2.30 tomorrow at the hub if you'll be on campus. Uh, and I mainly wanted to point it out because I know there's a really uh, interesting employer, at least the one that's going to be there that I've re uh, recognized. So Highly recommend. Uh, beyond that, um, we also happen to have lots of different uh, workshops and events that happen throughout the year. Um, lots of them are focused on you know, resume writing or uh, cover letters, again, uh, either hosting or uh, promoting other career fairs. There's for startups. There's one from the iSchool, the Environmental Career Fair. This is a very career fair heavy week, um, but these are cool ways just to get some basic uh, just tips and advice in a you know slightly more hands-off way. Uh, so again, highly recommend you know perusing our services here. Uh, but I also really want to draw attention to our career planning resources uh, because these are really great ways for you to again dive more into perhaps on your own the kind of DIY resources. Uh, about helping you better explore your options, like finding purpose for your uh, career path or for your degree, uh, helping you uh, learn more about internship searching or ways to revise your resume. Um, in addition to, again, our career coaching appointments, there's a lot that can go into that. Um, but regardless, there's a lot of cool things that uh, we can dive into in these conversations. Uh, one that I specifically wanted to point out was what we can kind of think about with our networking conversations too, uh, because again, that was something that was brought up earlier, the idea of exploring and learning more about our options. Um, and LinkedIn was actually something that was brought up in addition to like connecting with other faculty or alumni. Uh, this is the alumni kind of portion that can be really helpful. Uh, and I'll share this link as well, because this is a list of 5,355 people who you immediately have two things in common with because this is uh, all of the UW alum who has graduated with a degree in physics uh, from UW who have a LinkedIn profile. Uh, and this is a pretty good list of people. And I think LinkedIn is really cool for being able to kind of narrow that list down because uh, while the original number is 300 and basically 42,000, it's a little less daunting uh, to look at 5,000, but still pretty daunting. So being able to, from here, uh, start to recognize like, okay, yeah, I, I want to go to the career fair. I want to connect with someone who works at uh, this national lab. Uh, all right. So now I've narrowed that number down to 28. I want to make sure it's someone who lives in, uh, you know, the you know, Seattle or greater Seattle area. Uh, from here, we're looking at, you know, a much, a very, very reasonable number of eight. Um, but if it's something that's, you know, it's a little bit bigger or smaller of uh, different uh, filters that you want to use, you can narrow it down even further, like what they 
do uh, if you don't care about what you're specifically going to or where you're going to specifically be working, but you really want to do you know, stuff in the field of research or you want to work in operations or program and project management, uh, being able to narrow that down is really helpful because there are so many people here who do really interesting things. Uh, and it's firstly showing you a lot of PhD candidates because they are you know, connected to me a little more through UW, uh, but being able to scroll through and be like, oh, a research assistant who works you know, with Axion or uh, someone who works in astronomy or research scientist and engineer, and being able to recognize all the options and maybe even being able to you know, connect with these people, clicking connect, adding a note to your connection request and being being able to turn that into you know, a conversation, um, whether it's in prep for, you know, getting to meet with them at a career fair or, you know, otherwise, or whether it's so that you can, again, you know, start getting uh, maybe some informational interviews. Um, this is one of the other links that I just wanted to share uh, and just some general information about, uh, because the idea of networking really is kind of nerve wracking sometimes. I know when I was setting up uh, you know, some conversations with professionals. I was super nervous about it. Um, and an informational interview can really easily be described as just a quick conversation with someone who does something that you think is interesting. Um, and there's a couple of steps that come with it, like finding someone you want to interview, like using the UW LinkedIn alumni search tool, for example, uh, what I just pulled up. And, you know, preparing for the interview, like reading their profile so you can come up with interesting questions. But one of the things that even helped me in particular when I was going through and talking to people who worked in higher ed and trying to figure out what area within the field I was interested in, um, just trying to keep in mind that, that people love to talk about themselves. People love to be asked questions and they love to be able to oftentimes help someone who is asking those questions, who's still considering, you know, what they might love about a job, what they might dislike about a job or, you know, what it's like to work at a specific company. Uh, so trying to think about that as a way to frame the experience that people love to talk about themselves. Uh, and if you do reach out and you don't hear back, it's not because they didn't want to talk to you nine times out of 10. It's just because they either didn't get your email or they didn't have time. So keeping that in mind uh, can be really helpful. Uh, but informational interviews are just exciting, simple ways uh, to just you know start learning about your options and starting to figure out, you know, how can I do these things? Because uh, there's no one better to ask than the person who's doing it. Uh, so that brings us back to... Uh, you know, our website. So far, I've highlighted uh, our uh, coaching appointments. I've also highlighted our events and career fairs, uh, some of our DIY career planning resources, specific interest on networking. Uh, and that's going to lead me to the last thing that I wanted to highlight, which is our interest and identity resources. Uh, so these are another cool way, and this will be the final thing that I will share, uh, which can be an interesting way to explore uh, your communities or identities that you're interested in. Uh, for this uh, group, I'm going to share specifically the physical and life sciences uh, kind of page. And this can be an interesting way where we uh, to just learn more about uh, upcoming events or blog posts, uh, we'll sometimes call them, uh, like this is for an engineering career panel, uh, a lunching uh, or a lunch-based uh, networking event, uh, an environmental innovation challenge, and so on. So we try to keep this relatively up to date, um, as well as, you know, sharing information about job market trend data, uh, seeing maybe if at a national level, there's maybe more up to date info on some of those salaries that we're missing, even if it's not as specific uh, to each individual industry. Um, but this can be a cool way to look for job market trends um, for like chemical engineers or uh, civil engineering, you know, electronics and like uh, electronic engineering. Like if you were interested in this field, oh, don't know why it brought me to the top. But from here, we can learn more about nationwide. What are some of these trends or for a specific state uh, like Washington? What are some of these trends? Not sure why it keeps uh, throwing me back to the top. But you can even do it at the county level uh, to maybe learn more about what are the you know, how many employers, what are top employers, what are the technical skills, uh, which is pretty much exactly what uh, were shared earlier, but something that can maybe uh, you can come back to and, you know, pull from when you're maybe writing your resume, for example. Uh, so this can be a cool 
uh, resource also that is tailored to your field. Um, but from here, there's just a lot of cool you know, resources, like virtual interview practice and so on. Uh, but the main thing I would say is going to be uh, these blog posts of, of events in this job market trend data. Um, but either way, I really you know, uh, recommend that you interact with us in whatever way works best for you, uh, whether that be just you know looking at our resources, coming into our office, uh, or maybe attending our career fair tomorrow. Uh, but there's either way, just a lot of cool things that we can you know do with and for you. Um, and again, if there are any questions, feel free to ask them. But uh, if not, I will also share my email address so anyone can feel free to you know send questions. Thank you, Megan. That was great. Yeah, questions? Okay. All right, no questions yet. So we're waiting for our panelists to start uh, talking about real, real experiences and real careers. So um, uh, I don't know um, who, who wants to start. I think all our four panelists are here. Uh, I'm looking at the list here. Anybody wants to start from the panel? Volunteer? Ned, okay. All right, I can start. Hi, I'm okay. Ned Nostorovic. You. Yeah, you bet, Boris. Um, so I'm Ned Nostorovic. I run a company here called Seattle Photonics. Um, I actually went to school at UW and graduated in 1988, which feels like a really long time ago now. Um, so most of the professors I have have long since retired, um, but uh, it's always good to kind of go down there and see some of the new faces and all the cool stuff that's going on there. And uh, I didn't even get a chance to hang out in the new building. We were back uh, right off uh, Red Square back uh, back when I was in school. Um, in any event, um, after I finished UW in 88, I went on and got uh, a graduate degree. And um, the reason for that was actually I took uh, the 300 level optics course, uh, the lab optics course there at UW and fell in love with optics um, utterly. And um, making holograms and measuring the speed of light and all that stuff really kind of turned my crank. And so I went to uh, optics specific school in San Diego, San Diego State, uh, had a strong optics program there. Um, and then went on to start my PhD out in New Mexico. And uh, long story short, I ended up working at Hughes Aircraft, which is really not even a company anymore, um, making large projectors that were um, used on battleships of all things. But it really was an introduction into optics in terms of the whole the whole process of designing them, um, figuring out how you're going to hold them, and the fabrication of the glass and and the light sources and detectors and all that stuff. And that really worked well for me. And so my career sort of progressed through from Hughes to um, a company called Kaiser Electro Optics, where I kind of got to work with one of the guys that wrote the book on optics and then moved to Seattle. Since I grew up here, I wanted to move back. And long story short, I started Seattle Photonics in 1999 when there was a fair amount of capital investment from a lot of uh, ex-Microsofties who had too much money on their hand and had cool ideas. And um, it was just a really fertile time here in Seattle for a startup community. And I started this and with really the idea of just being able to support other companies externally with their optics problems. And so we work on everything from the cameras that go into your cell phones, uh, designing the optics for that, all the way up to we've worked on a number of space-based satellite platforms, They're both for Earth observing and external um, outside of Earth's atmosphere observing. Um, and a lot of industrial optics in between there. Um, and we worked on a lot of head-mounted displays. Oddly enough, Seattle is a really uh, large center for the development of optical systems for head-mounted displays with Microsoft being here and obviously Meta slash Facebook um, and all that. And so there's really a strong community of physicists that have migrated into the optics. Um, community as a general, I find that most of the optics guys who really are worth the salt started out in physics and, and later got an optics specific degree, you know, from University of Rochester or Arizona, which are both great schools. Um, so long story short there, uh, good for you for getting your physics degrees. I think for, as an, uh, an employer, we look for people that we can throw at different problems and not worry about them in terms of micromanaging them. So having skill sets where you can run MATLAB and you can develop a, your own code to analyze images um, that you may grab, or being able to throw you in the lab and build an experiment up to measure the power of a laser or 
any other number of different applications there. I think physicists in general are armed with tool sets that are much more broad that you can sort of stick them into these little problem areas and have a really good you know, likelihood of success in terms of solving those things. So we've hired a number of bachelor uh, kids right out of UW there um, over the years. Um, one is still sticking around. We've had a couple others move on to Boeing, another company here called Explore, which is a satellite company for um, external um, solar system type of satellites. A um, couple of folks at Amazon. And so it's just a, it's a great community, even if you don't want to leave Seattle for physicists to find employment from, you know, all sorts of people in the private sector, from Fortune 500 companies down to small little startups. We've actually got a really booming um, nuclear sort of uh, fusion center here in the greater Seattle area where there's a number of companies working on that. And clearly with SpaceX and a lot of the companies that spun out is associated with that in terms of the satellite industry, Seattle's a really strong market for that. So, you know, um, my just my one suggestion is, while I think everybody should try to find that one thing that you really love to do, and that's very important in your career moving forward, I think it, you'll find your jobs very easy if you love them. Um, and it's easy to kind of, you know, move up the ladder, if you will, in different companies. But be, don't be afraid of sticking yourself into an awkward situation, too, where you're learning something new. Because, again, as physicists, yeah, I'm hopeful that you're all curious you want to apply those math skills. You're not afraid to work with your hands too and, and, and do stuff like that. Um, so I'll leave it there. Thank you, Ned. That was great. Sure. How about Ariel? Maybe you can go next. Sure. Hi. So my name is Ariel Leon, and I graduated with my physics and astronomy uh, bachelor degree back in 2012, I think. And I am currently a software engineer at the Allen Institute for Brain Science. And let's see, so it, it was really hard for me to find a job right after I graduated and I ended up working in a, um, a research lab in the bio, uh, bioengineering building for a few years before I ended up at the Allen Institute where I've been for um, over almost eight years now. Um, and so, you know, when I, when I got into the Allen Institute, I first started basically plugging in cables and, um, aligning lasers for their optical system. So uh, kind of plugging that that optics heavy, heavy work that Ned was talking about. Um, I ended up doing a lot of laser optics um, and, uh, but I always loved analysis. I always loved um, software and <clears throat> kind of slowly migrated my way into a software engineering role, mostly for instrumentation where I worked for um, five years before I moved into a new position um, as a software engineer for the analysis team, where I build um, the pipeline infrastructure for all of their their um, their large acquisition systems. And so, you know, I Allen Institute, I feel like I got really lucky with the um, hiring manager was also a physics PhD grad himself from the University of Washington and knew that, you know, by hiring physics folks, you end up, you know, you can end up with a pretty good worker. Um, and I know that I am a good worker. And I think that my physics degree really helped me um, not be afraid of learning anything new. Like I, and I still do that, you know, I'm very curious um, and am able to jump into any problem and, and do my, do my hardest to, to try and solve it. And if I don't know how to solve it, I, uh, I know where to go. You know, you're, when you're in a company, you usually have resources all around you and people that are willing to help. Um, and so I, I, I definitely think that that's how physics, you know, played a role in my career and, and me moving up in my career as well. <clears throat> um, and then let's see. So I think the other thing is, is just being able to work on a team, being able to communicate effectively the, you know, the different problems that you're working on. Um, those are all things that I think physics really, really helped me in. And um yeah, I guess if you're coming into the field and you want to get a job, I would say, you know, it might be challenging, um, but do everything you can to get your foot in the door somewhere. I think that's one thing that was also really challenging for me was, you know, being an entry level UW graduate, you know, going to a FANG job for me wasn't, you know, some that was something that's that's really hard to do. And I think even now it's probably harder because the UW produces a lot of really great students. Um, that are all hungry for those entry-level positions. Um, 
but I mean, I still definitely try and apply, but don't be afraid to look at, at other companies that aren't necessarily paying positions, especially if you want to go into something like systems or, or software engineering. Um, and I would highly recommend working on projects uh, when you're in your undergrad. So if you can pair up with a professor and do some sort of um, research project where you're learning the skills that, that you really um, you know, gravitate towards, uh, definitely try that. And also any internships that you can get. That's something that I, I didn't do as an undergrad, but I kind of wish that I had. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Um, I would say that the Allen Institute has summer internship programs. We just passed the deadline. I think it was January 18th, but um, if you're interested, please apply. We have next year, we have so many different types of roles that happen at the Institute. Um, if you want to do optics, if you want to do electrical engineering, if you want to do analysis, um, if you want to, you know, do some more project management. Um, yeah, I would definitely recommend that that folks apply if, if they're interested. Um, and then one thing that I wanted to say talking, I think it was Boris or, or Megan that talked about it, but um, just definitely try to network as much as you can. And if it's just, you know, a copy with somebody asking them about their role and what they do in their company, about what their company does. I mean, that's all really good information for an amazing cover letter. And yes, everybody submit a cover letter. A lot of people think that it's not necessary, but you know, just do it. Um, put in those pitch words about the company just to show that you you know about the place that you're you're trying to apply to. Um, yeah, that's about it. Excellent. Thank you. So networking, networking. And more networking. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, how about Matt? Can you go next? Sure, I can go now. So um, my name is Matt Arrieta. I just graduated this uh, this past summer, 2023. Um, I did the comprehensive physics track, and I also studied astronomy. Um, and I participated in UW EcoCar, um, which I felt was important. I think participating in clubs on campus, you know, it helps a lot. So what do I do? Um, I work for General Dynamics Electric Boat. I do maintenance and modernization engineering. Um, I guess I should back up. If you've never heard of Electric Boat, I hadn't until about a year ago. Um, but they design, build, and maintain uh, all the nuclear submarines that are in America's fleet. So Virginia class, Ohio class, and uh, Seawolf class, and Los Angeles class, all those submarines. Um, and also New Newport News built some of them, but uh, all the design is done by Electric Boat. So in the maintenance and modernization department, what I do is um, when a boat, boats will come in for what's called availabilities. And when they need some upgrades, they need repairs, they need whatever, I help plan and organize and support the execution of that work. Um, and so what helped me a lot in this position from uh, a, like an undergraduate education at UW is uh, not necessarily the technical skills. Um, in my position, I don't really it's not very often, it's very infrequent that I, you know, you get down knit and greedy and get pencil to paper. Um, it's very infrequent. But what did help me a lot was um, the ability to take on a challenge and not be afraid to take on a lot of work. Um, you know, my mindset was, you know, if, if I pass physics 228, I can do anything. And I think you guys should think that way too. If you guys are making it through that class, you're, you're superheroes. So, um, and another thing is to develop a toolbox. Um, it's kind of, it's really the same, it's the same way you approach, you know, when you sit down for your exam and you see a problem on the paper um, and you got to think, okay, what, what tools do I have to, to, to reach a solution? Um, it's the same idea um, in my position, you know, you get, okay, you know, a boat's coming in, this system's broken, this is the information that Ships Force gave us. How can I develop, you know, what, what kinds of things am I looking for in my solution? How can I fix this? Um, what am I going to need to get my solution enacted? Um, those kinds of things, um, and not just, you know, developing a toolbox, but also the ability to learn quickly, take in a lot of information, you know, something you have to do as a physics major. And then, um, in my position, at least, you know, for, for my department alone, there's over 900, uh, like directives that you need to be cognizant of. And on top of that, you have thousands of pages of military standards and, and specifications that you need to know about. So really just the ability to learn quickly and, and pull out those key pieces of information that you'll need. Um, and, you know, other is on the topic of skills, you need to be successful. Um, a big one is have reasoning behind your actions. 
So the same way if, um, you know, if I'm working on a test and I don't know, you know, I, I can't figure out the problem, I can at least put something, I can get something down and try to get that partial credit. It's the same idea here. Um, just try to have reasoning behind your actions because there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, guardrails that prevent you from going totally off the rails and doing something really, you know, disastrous. But if you do make a misstep, you want to have a reasoning on why you did it. And you won't want to just say, well, just because, or it's, you know, the, the guys in the off sites did it. And so I thought I could do it or whatever. Um, and also communication, um, soft skills are deceptively important. It's really, really important to be able to communicate your own ideas and be persuasive. Um, especially when you have to interface with, um, uh, the customer. So obviously since we're building nuclear submarines, the only customer is the Navy It'd be kind of strange if there are other customers, but when you do have to interact with the customer, it's the same kind of idea. You know, you want to make them, you want to make them happy. You want to be diplomatic, um, Sometimes you run into a little, you know, you know, you get into a little scuffle and you don't necessarily agree, um, but you have to, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you have to make them happy. Um, and then lastly, with, uh, you know, opportunities for you guys, um, it's uh, the shipbuilding industry is, at least for submarines, is expanding a lot right now. So this started back under President Obama, the... Um, Basically, the idea is we want two new Virginia class and one new Columbia class, which is Ohio replacement, every single year. So that's three submarines. That's basically double what we're building right now. And on top of that, we've made agreements. You might have seen it in the news. Um, there's this agreement, this partnership called AUKUS, Australia, United Kingdom, United States, where we're sharing submarines with Australia. And we're actually going to give them to uh, uh, one or two Virginia class subs. So basically, what that means is... Um, there's a lot of expansion in the, in the industry right now. Lots of new jobs. Um, to put it into perspective, electric boat employs roughly 22,000 people right now across all its sites. And they're aiming to hire about 5,000 people every single year. So that's a lot of people that they're hiring, a lot of opportunity. And um, I also, I noticed by coincidence when, when Megan was sharing her screen about the, uh, the career fair in, um, uh, in the hub, Three of the seats there. So for there's I saw one for Newark Naval Undersea Warfare Center. Um, they're related. We work closely with them a lot. Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard, another one that we work closely with a lot, and Puget Sound Naval Shipyard. So they've got three booths over there just hiring people for essentially building submarines. Um, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of opportunity. Um, and it's definitely something to look into. So that's all I have. Thank you, Matt. That's great. Thanks. And Johnny, last but not least. All right. Thank you, Boris. Gosh, wow. So fascinating how all the panelists are working in very different jobs. Gosh, I'm feeling a little imposter syndrome here. Yeah. Um, yeah, let me introduce myself. I'm Johnny. I graduated from UW December of 2022 from the Applied Physics track. Um, so I'm pretty new uh, in industry. Um, since I graduated, I had a brief like three month stint writing some simulation software for an astronomy lab. And then I started my full time job as a backend software engineer at a separate security startup called Strong VM. Um, yeah, so uh, while I don't use my physics knowledge in my job a lot, um, I think it definitely helps uh, train me in just thinking and working through the kind of problems that I do. Um, I think it's a lot of being a software engineer is a lot of thinking about. Um, modeling different things using software. So um, all those crazy physics models I learned during undergrad um, that are really complicated, have a lot of connections between them, have a lot of equations that translate between different things. Um, I think that's a similar way of thinking in software where you have different um, entities you're trying to model, different functions that like do different things between them. So. Um, I think that's definitely helped me not be intimidated by working with these like really large code bases with a lot of complexity. Um, yeah, and I think um, you know jumping in straight into a software job from a physics undergrad degree, I think I definitely did have a lot of knowledge gaps and domain specific knowledge, but I wanted to highlight something Ariel said earlier about um, physics majors. I think we are like really curious people and comfortable jumping into unfamiliar problems. so. I think that definitely helped me um, yeah, just learning a lot on the job and being 
okay with that. I probably deal with like, you know, 10 different terms that I've never heard of like every week. And uh, I'm sure you guys will have the experience of like reading, reading those undergrad textbooks and being like, oh my gosh, why are there so many terms? <laughs> um, so it's helpful, you know, it's, it's for something. Yeah. And I think another big skill um, is just technical communication. So um, undergrad tutorials, those were, those were slog, but you know, we got some good practice in there for talking to your desk mates about technical problems. All right. Um, yeah. So then I think um, another thing I want to talk about is just some different skills um, that are helpful. I think to be a software engineer, the most obvious skill you need is to know how to program. Um, so I never programmed before I came to college. So I decided to take some intro programming classes um, from the computer science department. Back in my day, they had a rep for being really hard and like read out classes, but I hear it proved a lot and uh, don't be intimidated. There's like a ton of resources in those classes. If you're interested and don't know programming, um, UW has a lot of different classes you can take. And I think um, taking intro classes um, specifically like from the computer science department helped me because it opened up um, opportunities to take upper div classes to learn about different things like um, programming with databases, like um, concepts about distributed systems, or, you know, I didn't take this, but, you know, some of my friends did like machine learning classes, which is helpful. Um, and I think once you get a little programming experience, um, you can, or once you get some programming knowledge, I think it's helpful to get some experience um, applying that knowledge. So the physics department has more classes with a programming component like every year, so take advantage of those and then I think for me, um, how I got my uh, how I got my experience um, during undergrad was um, through a couple of internships. But I know internships are hard, so there are definitely opportunities like research. Um, I did a little bit of that after I graduated, and as well as different engineering clubs. You know, Matt talked about doing eco car during undergrad. There are a ton of clubs where you can apply your programming knowledge. So definitely take advantage of those. Yeah, and I guess, you know, I just wanted to end on a little note about like um, my own career path, I think. I, I'm still very young, very much learning, um, but yeah, career paths aren't linear. You know, I'm, I guess like, if you want to characterize my career path with a certain archetype, you could probably call me the career changer. I went to college thinking maybe I want to do physics, maybe I want to do something tech. I kind of decided physics, but then later changed my mind again um, so yeah, if you don't know what you're doing yet, don't worry, talk to a lot of people, you know, do a lot of networking. I think you'll, you'll have it figured out. Yeah. Okay. Very nice. Thanks. All right. Wow. Very, very, um, a lot of perspectives from both uh, recent uh, graduates and not so recent ones, but now is the time for questions from the undergrads were here. We're still here. <laughs> Please just uh, go ahead. Man. Uh, I actually have a question. Um, so if, if any of you, were any of you like considering doing research and like how did you decide to uh, go into industry. Well, I know, I know Ned and I ended up going to grad school, but, um, but like, how, how did you end up deciding to, to go into industry rather than, you know, like pursuing a graduate program or something uh, like that? Yeah, very nice. Um, anybody wants to take a stab? Just, we'll start with Ned again. <laughs> Oh, yeah. So, I mean, for me, it was like, I just didn't feel like I had enough, you know, in my, in my specific love to the, uh, within my undergraduate career. And I wanted to expand on it. I will say though, some of the kids that have come through here, some of it's a financial, you know, reality, right? I mean, grad school is not cheap. <laughs> I mean, and it's basically, you know, a couple of years probably of, of not necessarily making a great income too. Um, I will say though, that, um, it's somewhat flipped on its head. You know, I know, I know Matthew kind of comes at it a little bit from a, a government thing, but 
a lot of physicists and a lot of engineers, you know, when I was young, about 90% of us were doing, it felt like some sort of either civil service or defense related or something under the kind of the umbrella of government work as a whole when you came out of school. Um, and that's been flipped on its head. I mean, it's, I mean, when you think about, you know, just again, this, I'm being very Nietzsche here in optics, like, like cell phone camera lenses are just ubiquitous, right? I mean, all of that stuff is designed by us folks. Um, and so there's just a lot more career opportunities coming out of school and all these, you know, Fortune 500 companies and these bigger companies, are, they just, they have armies of engineers that need to get stuff done. And I don't think it was really like that even, you know, certainly 20 to 30 years ago, kind of when I was coming out of school. So I think that's, I think there's just a lot more opportunity now. I mean, I know a lot of these kids uh, that we've hired, for example, you know, they're doing, they're doing all right. I mean, 60 to 80 K coming right out of school just with your bachelor's degree. And that's, that's, that's a big draw, right? So I can't speak for everybody else here. I mean, maybe the other three younger folks here can can talk to something a little bit more with more recency bias than me. <laughs> Thanks, Ned. Johnny, you want to chip in? Sure. Um, yeah, I think for me, honest answer, it came down to, I was like a junior. I had no research experience, but I thought, okay, I don't think I'll do research. Um, it's a little, a little too late, but then I ended up doing research after I graduated, so. Yeah, who knows? But um, I think for me, the for me the consideration was more. I I think I didn't want to do um, grad school for a long time, and I after a few internships, I realized I enjoyed working more. So I think a practical tip to know is just to you know get some experience doing some research, get some experience doing working like full time, and see which one you like better. Thanks, Ariel. Yeah, so there was a couple of reasons why I decided um, to go into industry. So I actually had a lot of research as an undergraduate under my belt. I was on three different projects um, when I was in school, but um, I think I was I think I was first financially motivated. Um, but second, I also knew that um, going into grad school at least uh, would, you know, what would what would be the end game? The end game would be to get my PhD and to become a professor, which um, I know it's really hard to do, especially in right now in today's market. Um, but then I was also thinking about, well, I could start earning money now or get a PhD and then maybe earn a higher amount. But I felt like, you know, if I was working without a PhD for that many years, that maybe it would be about the same, um, which I think that's true. It is. Um, and then the other thing is, is that, you know, even though I didn't go to grad school, I'm at least in the company that I'm at, I'm, I'm very much research adjacent. I'm right there working with neuroscientists, answering really hard, um, questions. Uh, so I kind of, I get to, you know, have my cake and eat it too. So. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So I agreed with, with what Ned spoke about a lot, um, you know, it's it's a balancing act between, um, you know, the opportunity cost of, of spending another two, four, six years in school and, you know, your, your education costs with doing that. Um, and in, in my opinion, it just wasn't, um, it wasn't something I wanted to pursue. I wanted to do something different. I wanted to get out into the field and, and do something different after, you know, spending, um, you know, my whole life in school, basically, um, I wanted to do something different, you know, as much as I wanted to do research and I would have liked it. It's just, um, you know, you got to balance what, what you want to do in the short term. And, you know, it's not like if you go out in industry, right. When you graduate, it's not like you're, you know, you're signing the rest of your life away. It's like, um, you know, you could go out for two, three years and say, maybe I want to come back or maybe I'll find a company that will pay for my master's or, something like that, you know, there's, there's tons of opportunities and it's not like you're, you know, locking the door behind you. So um, that was my thought process. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I can just maybe just, just follow up on that real quick. Uh, it is not unheard of uh, to come back and do a grad school PhD even uh, after spending a couple of years um, working. Uh, after your bachelor's, I've had uh, two uh, PhD students like that in my lab, and I would say they're probably the best students I've had. They have work, work ethics that you don't find in kids who go straight from 
from the you know, undergraduate program. So it's a valuable. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Um, more questions? Uh, I think so. Uh, we have one hour for this. Is that a strict time limit? I think because we're getting close to that one hour bar. Jeannie, is that is that the we can go more. okay a little bit okay well we'll try not to but uh <laughs> um other questions please people who are here to learn about careers your questions all right zero uh yeah I have a question so uh how common it is or how acceptable to learn ability after you get the job or you just actually need the ability before you apply for the job. Okay, thank you. Um, who wants to start? Ned? Yeah, the old man here, everybody's being very gracious to me, thank you. Um, look, I, you know, as, as again, an employer, we don't expect kids that are fresh out of school to know exactly you know, how to do stuff. I think we, you know, I see some heads nodding there. You know, we all expect you to have a tool set. And and again, I think it's just, just being curious and willing to dive into a job. And, and I think that's as, what as employers that we really look for is just uh, kind of an earnestness and and, a, and a, an enjoyment in sort of that technical challenge. Um, you know, we're expecting you to code, right? Or to some extent, right? There's different levels of that, but the specificity of it is, is, is so varied you can be you know high data throughput managing you know terabytes of data type person or you can be some guys doing image processing analysis or then there's a whole mess of that and they, you can't cover all of that in four years of undergraduate um so i don't think anybody here will say that we expect you to have exactly what an employer is looking for it's just kind of a, a willingness to learn and, and a basic tool set and understanding of math and, and physics principles Sorry, can I just, uh, there's a there's a question from Julie in the chat, which is kind of related, right? Uh, once hired, was it daunting learning the tasks needed for the job? So maybe if uh, you're answering the, uh, the two, maybe you can answer these two questions um, together. So um, I don't know, Arian, thoughts? Yeah, I was going to say um, uh, for Julian's question, uh, it it was a little daunting. I think when I first started, it was a lot, it was like six months of like drinking from the fire hose. Um, <laughs> but it's, again, it's one of those things that, you know, I, I felt confident enough to be able to just kind of go in. And the other thing I was going to say, one thing that I definitely learned from um, my physics undergraduate was not just look at the whole thing that you have to accomplish, but being able to break it down into smaller bits, which is a lot more manageable um, and gets you closer to exactly what you need to do. Um, and then I just want to make sure that what was the other question again? Um, Zero's question? Yeah. Uh, so I was asking uh, how common it is to learn ability after you get the job instead of before you apply the job. So yeah, so I think that, you know, when they, when they, they will put out, they being hiring managers will put out exactly what experience they want um, on the job requisition but there is gonna be a lot of things that you need to learn um, going in. And um, uh, yeah, so it, it just really depends on like what the task is, like what what skill that you're, you're trying to learn, but most people will hire you because of a base set of requirements that you came in saying that you could do. Um, and everything else from that is just, is, is you learn when, after you get hired. Thank you. Uh, Matt? Exactly. Yeah, I, um, and again, I know I said this last time, but I agree again with, with what Ned was talking about. Um, you know, the no reasonable job is going to expect you to come in knowing everything unless, you know, maybe you've done the exact same position before and they're hiring you into a senior role already. Maybe, you know, but that's a different story. But in an entry level position, um, no one's going to realistically expect you to know everything. Um, there's a lot to learn. And, um, um, you know, another thing that's in, that you might want to look for, um, this is 
kind of tangentially related, but um, you know, as you're applying and as you're, you're interviewing, um, one thing you might want to look for is, you know, does this place I'm applying to have a, a, some kind of training program? Does it have a mentoring program? Um, like in, in my case, what really helped me is Electric Boat, at least the, the department that I was in, has a mentoring program. So when I got hired as a new hire, I was assigned a mentor. And when my mentor got hired, he was assigned a mentor. And there's a whole chain of mentors and mentees so that you can, you know, you have someone that's, you know, it's, they're like a sponsor for you. You know, they've got your back. Um, they take some, you know, when you fall, they take some of the responsibility too, because they're supposed to be there for you. Um, they help you learn. Um, and so, you know, that might be one thing that, you know, if it's, if it's something that you worry about, about, am I going to know, how am I going to be able to learn to do this job? Um, if it's intimidating, picking up a lot of information, which it can be. Um, maybe one thing you might want to look for is a place that does uh, a strong mentoring program and something that's going to have, you know, a structure for you to learn. Because again, it's, the, if the places that expect you to know everything right at the start as an entry level are, you know, they, they may not be the best place that you want to work if they have unrealistic expectations like that placed on you. Thank you. Johnny? Yeah, um, I guess nothing super different to add. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I think there's the baseline of what you need to know to get the job. And then there's all you need to know on the job. Um, I think that's how I would summarize it. And at least for um, for the tech world, usually that's, you need to know how to solve the coding challenges. They're all like really good resources out there for that. Um, and um, on, uh, on the note of like mentoring support and training, um, maybe a small tip from and my, my experience is I think smaller companies and startups might tend to have a less, um, less structured onboarding program established, but then it might have higher degree of support because you have a smaller team. Um, big companies might, it varies a lot. Um, uh, big companies can vary by the team, can vary by like what department you're working for. But um, in general, I do feel like there's more established onboarding processes for new hires. So um, that was one challenge I faced when I like, uh, started at my company. It was the first time they hired new grads out of college. So um, definitely there was like a deep learning curve for me. Okay, thank you. Well, um, we're a little over time, um, but if there are some quick questions from students, we can probably keep going a little bit. Not. Any closing have... remarks? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, I have to sign off, but I was going to leave my okay. email in the chat. Thank um, you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll probably finish up um, anyway. So, okay. Well, thanks everybody. Thank you, the, the panelists, for the very different and similar as well perspectives and the information that you gave us. Uh, so uh, I would say that, oh, okay, we have, uh, I was going to share, say that uh, if you're interested in connecting with our panelists, pl please actually email me <laughs> and I will connect you up, but there is an email for Ariel. Um, and thank you all. Thanks.